Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, Light Up Your Western Blot, Fluorescent Western Blotting Tips, Tricks, and More, presented by Dr. Paul Haney, Senior Product Manager, Protein and Cell Analysis Thermo Fisher Scientific. I am Sarvi Greneman of Labreet, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labreet and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information about our sponsor, visit www.thermofisher.com. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your question into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located on the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Haney. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Greetings, everyone. Uh, today, I would like to speak with you about uh, Western blotting, specifically around uh, tips, tricks, and ways of making fluorescent blotting as easy and productive as possible. First though, I wanted to start about some facts about Western blotting. Uh, Western blotting remains one of the most widely performed uh, protein detection applications. It's estimated that well over 5 million Western blots are performed globally each year. Um, Western blotting remains quite popular despite uh, being a fairly old technique uh, developed in the 1970s. And it's particularly useful because it can determine protein expression, up and down regulation, response to drug treatments or stimuli in very complex samples. Uh, it's commonly used uh, downstream of protein purification, drug treatment, gene knockout, gene silencing. And it provides size information that's very important in determining the protein species that you're looking at. Um, here at Thermal Scientific, one of the uh, focuses we have is improving Western blotting to provide you with all the uh, products that you need for uh, reliable experiments uh, beginning to end, all the way from uh, protein gels to transfer uh, methods uh, to imaging systems, uh, substrates, antibodies, markers, uh, and more. Uh, we work to make this a, a workflow. Uh, where each step leads to the next and hopefully provide you the highest quality reagents and uh, methods available. Um, but I want to start specifically talking about fluorescent uh, Western blotting versus chemiluminescent Western blotting. Uh, chemiluminescent Western blotting is the most common method uh, used today. Uh, it's been around for uh, many, many years and it has uh, many good features. Uh, but fluorescent blotting, uh, Western blotting is becoming more and more popular uh, due to some uh, added benefits it can provide. So the differences between the two, uh, chemiluminescent uh, uses a indirect signal generated from an enzymatic reaction to produce light, uh, usually with HRP or L-FOS, um, where fluorescent Western blotting is using a directly conjugated fluorophore. Um, this has some different uh, effects on the Western blot, where signal duration, because it's using a uh, enzyme and chemiluminescent, uh, the duration is limited to a few minutes to a few hours, depending on the substrate you use. Where a fluorescent uh, Western blot is quite stable and the light input is, uh, output is consistent over a period of time. Uh, Sensitivity-wise, um, chemiluminescence, because it uh, uses an enzymatic reaction and there's a wide variety of substrates available, can be very, very sensitive uh, um, and allow you to see down to femtogram levels of, of protein. Uh, fluorescent Western blotting can be uh, also very sensitive, nearly as sensitive as chemiluminescent uh, Western blotting, um, but you may require higher antibody concentrations uh, of the secondary antibody to get a similar level of signal. 
uh, consistency. Um, both systems uh, can be very, very consistent or have inconsistency issues depending on the experiment being done. Um, there's possible variation between blots and chemiluminescence due to substrate changing uh, the amount of light given out over time and also the substrate that people are using. Uh, where fluorescent blots tend to be more consistent lab to lab to lab because everybody is using a very similar uh, dye. Um, detection methods, chemiluminescent has the advantage that you can acquire the image both on film and CCD-based uh, cameras. Uh, where fluorescent imaging typically requires uh, light sources for activation and filters, uh, so they're almost exclusively imaged on CCD-based or uh, laser-based imaging systems. Um, one of the main features I'll talk about uh, most today is around quantitation and one of the advantages that makes fluorescent becoming more popular. In the fluorescent western blotting, you can multiplex your sample and look at multiple targets uh, at the same time, which allows you to do um, normalization with uh, internal controls or look at multiple targets at the same time. And then other considerations, uh, chemiluminescent, uh, you can strip and reprobe uh, several times, uh, which is kind of an advantage by killing the HRP signal. This is a little more difficult with fluorescent western blotting. You can't strip and probe nearly as well. Um, but then also on fluorescent western blotting, you need to take uh, more care of avoiding a background fluorescent contamination, uh, where background in chemiluminescent, since it's only one light source giving off light and no excitation energy is needed, uh, the background can be very low. So looking once again at the differences between chronic chemiluminescent and western, we, fluorescent western blotting, here we have uh, two uh, western blots. The one on the left has three separate targets, HSP90, PDI, and uh, P23. And in this case, we have very clean antibodies, and we can detect all three of them at the same time using a chemiluminescent signal. However, uh, because they're all producing light in the same channel, uh, you cannot tell if the signal is unique to each antibody, even though I can de uh, detect them separately. If doing a fluorescent western blot, such as the image on the right, you can see I use two different species of antibody, uh, primary antibody for HSP90, and then a separate mouse antibody for PDI and P23. And then when I image them, uh, I can get two different colors, uh, make sure the signal's coming from a different secondary, and also get the images independently, where you have the HSP, a 90 signal on the top, and the PDI P, uh, and P23 image on the bottom as separate channels. Um, this allows you to multiplex them in quality control, and also turn different channels on and off to get the image that you want. Now I'll start with some general tips for fluorescent western blotting for much of the rest of the presentation. And I wanted to give you some examples of why these tips are important. As you can see on the right, um, there's a variety of different artifacts that you can get uh, with western blotting. Uh, if you're not careful, you can get uh, speckling and pixelation, such as the image on the top left. Uh, you can get uh, contamination on the bottom, such as lint or filters or fibers or other material giving off a uh, fluorescent signal. And, or you can have very high background, uh, as the image on the top right, um, by inappropriate blocking of the membrane, using the wrong membrane, using the wrong blockers, uh, or using the wrong antibody concentrations. So things, other things to avoid, uh, avoid marking uh, membranes with pens or pe uh, pens. Uh, the pen ink in pens tends to fluoresce and will give you signal uh, on the membrane. Instead, you, we recommend you use uh, pencils. Um, handle the membranes only with powder-free gloves or with blunt uh, forceps. Uh, powdered gloves or sharp edges will cause artifacts on uh, the membrane. Uh, and I already mentioned the powder-free uh, gloves. So. In the standard Western workflow, there's three basic steps. There's the separation step, the transfer step, and then the probe and detect step. I'll step through each of these individually because there's 
aspects of each part that are important for optimizing your Western blotting. So for separation, our portfolio contains a large number of products. Uh, there's the protein gels, uh, most uh, importantly, and that's what most of the discussion will, will go into, uh, which gels you use and when you use them influence your Western blot results. Um, but then other things uh, that are important are, you know, the gel tanks and casting apparatus that you use for good quality gels, the protein ladders I'll speak about. Uh, um, for Western blotting, the main thing we want to worry about is uh, the transfer range uh, and the molecular weight of the protein you're interested in. So most typically, uh, customers will use a bis-tris neutral gel chemistry, uh, such as our bolt gels and our new page gels, or a tris glycine uh, gel chemistry. Both are very good for a broad separation range, uh, recommended from around 10 to 250 uh, kilodaltons for Western blotting. Or often, however, often people want to look at higher or lower molecular weights, and their tendency is to stick with these standard gel chemistries, and that can produce some issues. What we strongly recommend is if you're doing high molecular weight uh, proteins, uh, particularly in that 200 and up range, is to consider tris acetate gel chemistries. And if you're doing low molecular weight proteins, to, uh, say 2.5 to 40 kilodaltons, we strongly recommend tris uh, tricene-based gel chemistries. And I'll show you some data on that uh, coming up in a few slides. But first, I also wanted to talk about some differences between this tris uh, neutral gel chemistry and tris glycine uh, gel chemistry. So some of the benefits of a neutral gel chemistry uh, are related to band integrity on Western blots. One of the things that people struggle with on Western blot are nonspecific bands or, or, or bands lighting up that they don't know what they are. As you can see on the right is a bolt bistris uh, gel and a TGX gel, uh, a tris glycine gel on the, the, the right both with the same proteins loaded and then uh, probed by Western blotting. Um, and as you can see on the right, uh, there's many breakdown products that can occur uh, at a high pH tris glycine gel. So if you're using his tris, uh, tris glycine, uh, if you're boiling your samples too significantly, if your uh, loading buffer pH is high, you can get breakdowns of the proteins of interest. And then these will show up on the Western blot as nonspecific bands. Uh, neutral gel chemistries uh, are much better for preserving uh, the integrity of your protein and not causing breakdown products. Uh, the example on the right is uh, extreme, uh, where we, you know, to use some additional heating to show the point. But quite often you get um, breakdown products uh, based on the higher pH. Also. Uh, Neutral gel chemistries tend to be much longer shelf life. Uh, they'll last up to 16 months. They're storable at room temperature, where a tris glycine gels have very, very short uh, shelf life, only up to a few months, and performance uh, radically breaks down over that time, and you'll get uh, fuzzier bands and more protein addicts and other issues as the gels age, where results with a bistris gel will be more consistent over time. Also, um, uh, typically with the bistris neutral gel, um, you can load higher amounts of proteins uh, that will allow better transfer without disturbing band straightness, sharpness, or uh, gel smiling. Going back to transfer of high molecular proteins, now talking about tris acetate gels. Um, you know, these are really optimal for separation of high uh, molecular weight proteins. In the center, you can sort of see a comparison of separation gels between tris glycine. Here's a 4 to 12, a bis tris 4 to 12, which are common gel chemistries, and then a tris acetate 3 to 8 percent. Where you can see the top of the gels on the bis tris and tris glycine, you're really maxing out around 200 and to, or to 250 molecular weight, where in the same separation, uh, you can get uh, 400 kd uh, protein separated and well separated from other high molecular weight proteins. Also then when you look at the separation on uh, the, the western body result, the transfer results, on the top right you see EGFR, uh, here transferred uh, doing a fast transfer in iBlot2, uh, seven minute transfer, and the results compared to a tris acetate gel 
and a trisglycine uh, mini wedge weld gel, an OVEX gel, 4 to 20 percent. So even though this is a 4 percent trisglycine gel, uh, which should allow uh, high molecular weight proteins to separate, you can see you get much better transfer efficiency and brighter signal using the tris acetate gel compared to uh, a 4 to 20 uh, gradient gel. Similar story can be seen in a low molecular weight protein. Um, here we're looking at a tricene gel. Um, and with a tricene gel, you can separate proteins all the way down to 2.5 molecular weight. On the right, once again, we have a 4 uh, to 20% trisglycine gel, in this case a, a Biorad TGX gel, similar to the Novex gel on the previous slide. And we're looking at, at caspase uh, 3 and cleaved versions of it, which are uh, there's two different forms, a 17 kilodalton protein and a 19 kilodalton protein. On the trisglycine gel, those uh, proteins are clearly separated and can be detected and quantified uh, separately, where on a uh, trisglycine gel, the separation of those bands is difficult and you do not get clean resolution between them. However, there's more to worry about than just separation size uh, with the gel. Uh, there's other things to worry about in terms of how you load the sample, what markers you use, and what loading buffers uh, you can use. And some of these things are specific to fluorescent western blotting that you may not have considered uh, when doing chemiluminescent western blotting. Um, for example, sample buffers containing blue or pink dyes, uh, such as bromophenol blue, uh, will fluoresce and can contribute to increased background or difficulty optimizing exposure time as the majority of camera systems optimize exposure for the brightest uh, portion of the gel, which can be the dye front. So for example, in the gel in the middle, you'll see a gel image that has a bromophenol containing sample buffer in the 680 channel. You can see that the dye front lights up very brightly. But if you use a fluorescent compatible buffer, uh, and we make uh, uh, some of these uh, available, um, you'll see a nice clean image on the right where no, with no dye front issue. Um, you can also see some things I'll talk about on the next slide related to the ladder. In this case, this is a standard ladder. Uh, it's not fluorescently labeled in any way intentionally, yet it still appears on the fluorescent image because it's stained with a blue dye. And I'll talk about that here. Um, so one thing to uh, be aware of is always be careful to optimize the amount of uh, pre-labeled uh, ladders you la load onto a Western blot. As you can see here in the middle is a standard uh, blue uh, dye labeled uh, pre-labeled ladder. And when you run it on a Western blot, and in this case detect it in the 680 channel, the blue dye becomes fluorescent and gives you a red ladder. This is very convenient. It allows you to uh, have a ladder that you can both visualize visually and in uh, a fluorescent western blot channel. But it can also be an issue if you overload uh, the, dot, the, the protein ladder, which are often at very high concentrations, uh, you can cause a very high signal in one or more of your fluorescent channels that you'll be detecting for western blotting. Um, other uh, ladders that are quite common, people will use multicolored or rainbow type ladders that have orange, blue, pink uh, bands in it. And in that case, each one of those dyes will often fluoresce in a different channel, and you can get uh, different patterns in each channel depending on the marker you use. So we really strongly recommend you use a single colored or, or non-stained uh, molecular weight marker. Um, and also make sure you dilute it down at an appropriate level uh, so it does not interfere with your Western blotting. Uh, other things we recommend that I'll talk about on this slide and the next slide is you can also use markers that have built-in Western blotting control, uh, such in this case in the middle, I'm using the Eyebright uh, pre-stain marker. It's a uh, blue marker, but also contains uh, non-labeled bands that react in a Western blot to act as a western block control. So I'll have the ladder show up due to its dye, and then in a separate channel, I'll have these two control proteins show up uh, that let me know my western block worked. Uh, my secondary antibody interacts with those bands, lights up, and it'll show me my western block work and is a built-in control 
if some of my other bands are not showing up. Other than the iWrite pre-stained molecular ladder, we also offer uh, Magic Mark. Uh, this is a ladder that's uh, composed of uh, molecules that react with uh, secondary antibody, and so they'll light up, uh, whether either you're using a chemiluminescent or fluorescent West, uh, secondary, and they'll, they'll light up in, in uh, a variety of different gel chemistries. Uh, it doesn't matter if they're denatured or not denatured, so they react with the protein uh, on a Western body, no problem. And then, of course, you can detect your protein of interest um, and compare it to the molecular weight uh, directly in the Western blotting. Uh, and you can do this fluorescently or chemiluminescent to have that in control, control uh, for molecular weight sizing. That's important with Western blotting. Uh, these are nice in that they're not stained and do not uh, cause uh, impact on any of the fluorescent channels. Now I'm going to move on to the transfer step. In transfer, there's a lot of options available uh, to researchers. Uh, you can do wet uh, transfers, such as uh, using our Invitrogen mini blot module. Um, you can do semi-dry uh, transfers. Uh, which is more of a rapid uh, transfer, about 10 minute transfer, where wet can be a two hour uh, transfer or more, or um, dry transfers, such as using um, Invitrogen iBlot 2 or Power Blotter uh, Select Stack consumables. And there's some uh, advantages and disadvantages across these portfolios that I'd like to talk that have a direct impact on your Western blot results. Which one you choose? Uh, it depends on your lab and what you're trying to do, you know, what buffers you want, how much speed, efficiency, ease of use, how much hands-on time, cost, uh, which membranes you want, uh, and convenience. Some of the artifacts that people uh, typically see in Western blotting. On the bottom right, you'll see a Western blot done with a traditional semi-dry transfer stack that put together by hand uh, and then uh, Compose your own buffers and transfer by yourself. Um, quite often you can see artifacts such as missing bands, uh, as you see in the second lane from the left, um, or other uh, spots in the middle. And these are caused by either not having the, the stack uh, pushed together hard enough, uh, gas bubbles that form during transfer uh, due to the electrical current and the high current going on. Um, you can also see that there's poor transfer up here of e, uh, KLH or EGFR. These high molecular weight proteins are not detected very well. And that's because semi-dry transfer, uh, the buffers, depending on which buffer you use, can often deplete and do not provide enough time to transfer the high molecular weight uh, proteins. On the top right, you'll see um, the Invitrogen Power Blotter Select Stacks or iBlot2 transfer stacks. This is a dry uh, transfer method that I'll uh, show in detail on the next slide, um, but it provides much better uh, transfer of high molecular weight proteins, as you can see by the KLH or EGFR signal. It also doesn't generate gases. Um, the consumables also have this dry agarose um, sheet in it that allows very good mating with your gel and membranes, holds the whole thing together, and you do not get dead spots. You also don't have to worry about wetting the membrane, so uneven hydration, uh, which quite often causes uh, transfer issues, uh, insufficient removal of methanol or ethanol for PD PVDF, which can cause artifacts also on your gel. So how does uh, dry transfer work? In this case, if you look at the image on the right, um, we have a, uh, depends on the device you're using, uh, there can be an electrode built into consumable or not, uh, or it can use uh, electrodes in, uh, in the device. But then there's a top uh, buffer matrix, which is uh, solidified into an agarose uh, slug. It also uses a polymeric uh, charged molecule instead of straight uh, uh, buffers that uh, move very quickly. So this slows down the movement of the, uh, the uh, the charge across the gel and membrane. Uh, so it's still very fast, but unlike a buffer, which can deplete and decast rapidly, it allows even transfer across the whole gel. And it makes a more consistent transfer to top to bottom because of the polymeric nature of the electrolytes in the, in the top gel and in the bottom gel. 
Um, and also the sandwich holds together a lot better. Um, there's not just buffers that cause gases uh, or a bowing that has to be pushed together and held together by clamps. Uh, the whole system stays together as a sandwich uh, very well and does not introduce uh, air gaps. Now there are some cons to, uh, you know, the iBlot 2 or PowerBlot dry consumable. It does require specialized consumables and specialized st stacks. And they can, because of the polymeric na nature of the amphalites used, can cause a slight fluorescent background compared to uh, standard buffers and just membrane stacks. Just to kind of give some example uh, data, though, uh, while I mentioned fluorescent background, it, it can be very, very minor. So on the right, I have a Western blot with KLH, PDI, P, uh, P23, a variety of different molecular weights. On the right is a chemiluminescent detection. You get very good uh, detection across a wide range of lysate concentrations. So we're here we're using an A431 lysate, starting at a 20 microgram load and going down to as little as nine mic nanograms of lysate loaded. On the right, you have the same Western blot, but in this case, we're detecting uh, uh, more proteins. Here we add a kilertrogen, which is a very uh, similar mass to PDI, and we detected it with a different fluorescent uh, antibody, so a separate channel. So here you can see we're detecting five different uh, uh, proteins at the same time, and you can see a very similar level of sensitivity from using 20 micrograms down to nan uh, 9 nanograms as you can with the chemiluminescent uh, detection. All right, I wanted to highlight one more um, aspect about performance of wet transfers, because wet transfers can give very good results, and they are sort of the standard. But you have to be careful when doing a wet blot on what you choose, and particularly for fluorescent western blotting. And that can be seen in the membrane choice uh, you choose. So the membrane uh, that you choose for fluorescent uh, western blotting can be a major source of background. Um, so you want to make sure you use membranes with low autofluorescence, and uh, this includes both nitrocellulose and PVDF membranes. Over on the right, you can see a variety of different membranes, um, just detecting the membranes themselves, exposing them uh, in a fluorescent channel to, to light and doing a one second exposure. Here you can see nitrocellulose. It does give a little bit higher um, background in 488, but it's still pretty clean in 488, and then reduced background in the 680 and 800 channels. Uh, on the very bottom, you have a standard PBDF, a 0.45 PBDF, and here you can see it gives very, very high background, uh, almost immediately washes out or blanks out your signal in both the 48 channel and also a, a significantly higher background in, in the 680 or 700 uh, channel also, and it would also have high background in 550, 650 uh, channels. But low fluorescence PBDF, such as in the middle, you can see it provides very little or no background in the 48, 680, or 800 channel. So the membranes you choose is very important, and different membrane qualities exist uh, throughout the world. Um, so while optimizing membrane is important also for chemiluminescence, it's much more important uh, for uh, fluorescence detection. Next, I'm going to move on to the immunity detection step. Uh, this is both the detect uh, immunoprobing with antibodies, uh, blockers, and secondaries, um, and then the last step, detecting uh, on an imaging system. This is probably the most complex portion of fluorescent western blotting and the part that you'll want to need to do the most research on to find the right uh, antibodies and targets for you. There's a lot of uh, parts that go into this. Uh, step. There's the blocking reagents, uh, which I'll talk a, a lot about. There's the antibodies, and we offer a variety of blocking reagents. We, we offer up to 70,000 different antibodies, uh, both primary and secondary antibodies. There's the washing reagents, whether you're using PBS, tween, uh, PBS, TBS, or tween based solutions. Uh, there's the secondary antibodies. Of course, there's the wide variety of Alexa Floor secondaries and Alexa Floor Plus secondaries for fluorescent western blotting, as well as all the HRP uh, conjugated secondaries uh, for chemiluminescent western blotting. 
and then the detection steps such as imaging on a, on a Eyebright uh, FL imaging system. Uh, there, there's tricks and important factors in each one of these steps. I'll talk mostly about blocking buffers, primary antibodies, secondary antibodies, and the detection system. So one of the most important things to optimize uh, for fluorescent western blotting and chemiluminescent western blotting is uh, the blocking step and the blocking buffer. Um, you want to use only high quality filtered buffers. Uh, particles and contaminants in the washing and blocking buffers can settle on the membranes and cause fluorescent artifacts such as I showed on the first slide, uh, one of the earlier slides. You also want to use blocking buffers or washing buffers that limit the use of detergents. Uh, which are often quite common in these steps, uh, but these detergents can cause fluorescent background or autofluorescence um, in, in a fluorescent-based Western blotting. Um, also, the blocker you choose uh, makes a big impact on the results of your Western blot, and I'll talk about that on this slide and on the next slide. As you can see up here on the top right, we have a Western blot for three different targets. Um, uh, displayed in green and red, um, <clears throat> and you can see a really good signal, low background with uh, the chemi uh, chem thermal scientific uh, fluorescent uh, blocker. However, if you use milk, uh, such as on the right, what you'll see is that actually milk can sometimes overblock, and we've made this entire second uh, band of green vanish in this case. It's knocked out detection of that band. Um, also, on how you image, if the blot is wet or dry, um, it will have an impact on the timing and the signal intensity. Um, and this is somewhat dye dependent, but it's also blocking buffer dependent because uh, it, it influences the oxidation of the, uh, the dyes and also how well the, the signal remains blocked. So if you look at the P23 on the bottom here, uh, there's a blot that's been imaged two days after the initial scan. On the left, you can still see very bright uh, red signal uh, across the gel, where the milk signal, both in the green channel and the red channel, has, begin, uh, has started to fade, and uh, we've lost that signal uh, in that fluorescent blot. Um, the blocker also has a lot of dependence on the non-specific interactions you see, and on background, which I display uh, on this uh, slide using a variety of fairly ugly Western blots. So uh, once again, on the left, you have the thermoscientific fluorescent blocker, and then 5% milk in the middle, and on the right, another spe uh, specialty uh, blocker. And I just wanted to point out some different highlights once again. So here we have EGFR, STAT3, and REST10. In this case, regardless of blocker, um, very strong blockers such as MELS, MELK, the thermal uh, fluorescent blocker, you can see a lot of nonspecific binding in the EGFR green channel. So this is not the impact of uh, a bad blocker. In this case, blocking is very good because you do not see nonspecific bands in the red channels uh, for STAT3 or RAS10. So this is more of an antibody problem. Something's happened to this antibody. Uh, it's either degraded over time uh, or uh, you have some nonspecific uh, targets in this uh, lysate due to breakdown of the EGDF molecule. Uh, probably a little bit of both. Uh, all the nonspecific binding is below the EGFR, but it's also most likely this EGFR antibody uh, was quite poor and, and old or degraded over time. However, once again in milk, uh, here's a different target looking at RAS10. You can see uh, the red signal from the RAS10 is uh, almost completely blocked and, and non-visible uh, when using milk uh, due to excessive blocking. On the other uh, end, we have what can happen with uh, low-level insufficient blocking. So in this case, you see a high level of red background across all of the membrane, and that's because there was insufficient blocking to block uh, both the membrane fluorescence or it, really the case is blocking secondary and primary antibody binding across the target. Uh, so you're getting a high background due to insufficient blocking. 
But you can also see now if you look at the RAS10 signal, the RAS10 signal at the bottom is actually quite high because it's not overblocked uh, in this case. But in this case, it's about finding the optimal balance between blocking and insufficient blocking for that target. So in terms of choosing the right blocker, uh, buffer, um, you do need to optimize. It's a little bit unpredictable. Uh, different blocking buffers differ uh, based on the target you're looking at. Uh, we recommend that you test multiple multi uh, blocking buffers to find the best signal to noise ratio for your targets. Um, but there are some recommendations. I would generally recommend you start with uh, our fluorescent western block blocking buffer. It's designed to reduce cross-reactivity and produce high signal-to-noise ratios. Another good choice is a starting block. Um, it's sort of a middle-of-the-road blocker that prevents both under-blocking and over-blocking. So it's a good option to choose as, as a starting point uh, for blocking experiments. And then if you have very special cases where you want to make sure you're mammalian-free, uh, you can try other uh, options such as C-block uh, which uses fish serum that reduces non-specific binding to antibodies to other uh, to other mammalian proteins. Other considerations, if you're doing uh, probing for phospho uh, specific targets, you may want to avoid blockers containing caseins uh, because uh, casein has a high number of correlation sites on it and can interfere with phospho protein detection. Antibody selection, of course, is one of the most important parts of Western blotting, and Thermal Scientific offers uh, a wide variety of both primary and secondary antibodies. We offer over uh, 70,000 antibodies. Um, in fact, it may be over 100,000 antibodies at this point in time. So a very extensive uh, portfolio. We're, we've put a lot of effort into validating our content. Um, so we want to validate it for a specific uh, application. You want to look for antibodies that are specifically uh, validated for Western blotting, because antibodies that work uh, in ELISA's or um, IHC or immunofluorescence do not necessarily work equivalently across different applications. Uh, and, uh, but another important point to know, know is look for antibody performance guarantee, uh, which allows you to enable uh, you to purchase antibodies with confidence and try alternative antibodies with minimal risk if they do not work for your, uh, for your needs. It's similar to validation for primary antibodies, to be specific to the target of interest. Uh, you need to be careful about the secondary antibody. Um, there's a variety of considerations to look at. You want to use antibodies that, of course, are matched to your, your primary antibody, so species match. You want to use uh, good anti-goat or anti-mouse uh, antibodies, but you also want to make sure they're highly cross-absorbed. Um, you want to look for antibodies that have been cross-absorbed versus bovine, goat, rabbit, uh, uh, rat, human, based on what their, pri their target is, to avoid these cross-reactions uh, and allow you to do multiplex experiments with minimal worry of cross-contamination. But you also uh, need to worry about what dyes or, or enzymes are connected to the secondary. Not all secondaries are created equal. Um, oops, uh, I'll come back to that. I skipped a slide in my brain, uh, so I'll hit the dyes in a, a later slide. But here uh, is experiments looking at how you set up multiplex experiments and how you choose what you want. So here we have a rabbit uh, anti-HSP primary, HSP90 uh, primary, and then mouse anti-PDI, anti-PD3. And we're detecting with uh, anti-rabbit, Alexaflor plus 800, uh, the green channel, and then anti-mouse, Alexaflor plus uh, 680 uh, for both of those targets. And you can get a very clean Western blotting. Um, but here I'm only using uh, two species, mouse and, and and rabbit, which are very common. So if I want to do a, you know, a higher plex experiment, say a fourplex experiment, as you see over here on the right, how do I go about doing that? So you want to look for multiple different species. Uh, such here, we once again have the, uh, the rabbit anti-HSP90 anti and the same mouse. But in this case, we've now used uh, chicken, uh, a chicken anti-calertrogen antibody. 
And then up top, we are using an HA tagged uh, target. So this protein has been HA tagged. And then uh, we're detecting with an anti-HA, an anti-rabbit, anti-chicken, and anti-mouse, which allows a fourplex experiment, uh, very clean, minimal cross-reactivity, and no background. Other things you can look for are using primary antibodies that are directly conjugated. So there's a variety of commercially available directly conjugated primary antibodies, particularly around anti-tag uh, primary antibodies. Uh, but you also have the ability to label primary antibodies uh, through a variety of labeling kits that are available. And so always consider that as an option. Particularly if you're going to be doing uh, the similar experiments over and over, or are trying to do normalization. So quite often, pre-labeled antibodies are available to uh, standard housekeeping gene uh, or, or tag, uh, tagged proteins. Other things to uh, worry about is what dyes are connected to the secondary and how, what concentration you use them at. Typically in a chemiluminescent Western blotting, one of the common, common errors is to use too high of a concentration. Uh, and you get high background because the chemiluminescent signal and these uh, substrates are very, very active and they do not need much target to uh, produce the, the light uh, and, and turn over the enzymatic reaction. So it's not uncommon to use 1 to 20, 1 to 100, or 1 to 200,000 dilutions for chemiluminescent uh, detection with a secondary uh, antibody. Uh, for fluorescence, since it's a direct measure uh, and there's no enzymatic reaction, you actually want to use a uh, higher concentration of secondary uh, antibodies. And I'll give you some, show you some data as why over here on the right. So here I have uh, a target that is detected uh, <clears throat> with five different uh, fluorophores, Electrophore plus, 488, 555, 647. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 680 and 800. And I used a secondary dilution of 1 to 5,000, 1 to 10,000, or 1 to 20,000. And here's the antibody concentration of secondary uh, down below. So 0.4 micrograms down to 0.1 microgram per mil. As you can see, I got very good signal and a good image, regardless of what uh, dye I chose, 48 down to 800. So all of them are are equally available to you, and you should feel comfortable using all of them. Uh, don't feel uh, that you should be using just the 800 or 700 dyes. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I, I love and use all these other dyes quite frequently. But over on the right, we look at exposure time. So as I increase the dilution amount, and I look at the, the 488 channel, you can see in this case, it only takes um, uh, <clears throat> a few milliseconds, uh, to uh, get the image of 48, and then as I dilute it, the time increases to about 1.3 uh, seconds. That's not much of a big deal in 48. 488 channel is very, very bright and very bright dyes. Um, and then as I go to 555, you can see it takes 0.7 seconds up to 1.6 seconds, and then uh, 650 goes from 1.5 to 2.8 seconds. And then if I go up to the 800 channel, it may take up to 12 seconds, uh, up to 27 seconds. Very low background in the 800 channel, so I can go for longer periods of time. Um, but the dyes and the lighting sources are quite often not as powerful or as bright in the 700 and 800 channels. Uh, and so the timing may take uh, longer, depending on the imaging system you're using and the lighting source and camera uh, that's detecting them. Also, different dyes have different intensities, uh, much like chemiluminescence, where you can have uh, low sensitivity ECL substrates up to very, very high uh, sensitivity substrates, such as supersignal femto. Uh, the secondary you use, how it's conjugated, how much dye is on the conjugate. Uh, too little dye gives weak, weak signal. Too much dye can cause quenching. But also the brightness of dye. So here on the left, you see a Western blot done with an Alexa 4 Plus uh, secondary with a Alexa 4 Plus 800 dye. You get very good uh, levels of sensitivity down to 0 0.06 micrograms of lysate uh, for both HSP90 and HDAC. Uh, where if I use another uh, 
800 dye, you can see I significantly lose sensitivity, even though it's the same species as secondary and conjugated at a very similar level. The dye is simply not as bright uh, and may be more prone to oxidation uh, than Alexapore Plus. So when preparing, choosing your fluorophor to do a multi, uh, to do a fluorescent western bond, it really what you want to consider is how many targets are you trying to uh, detect. If you're only doing one conjugate, as I was saying, uh, any channel would be appropriate. Um, you just, you know, you, you have choices down to 500, you have uh, 600, 700, 800 wavelength. They're all uh, completely appropriate. So you may just start with Alexa Porous uh, plus uh, 650. If you're going to do two targets, you'd want to look for, uh, you know, and this could be rat, uh, mouse, uh, goat, it wouldn't matter at all when you're only looking at one target. If you're going to two targets, you may want to choose a rat, uh, rabbit and then a mouse a secondary and choose Alexa 4 plus 650 and then Alexa 4 uh, uh, 546 uh, as your second conjugate. As you go down and you want to do three targets, then you, you choose a rabbit uh, uh, 650, a, a mouse 550, and then if you can find a ra uh, a another species, uh, chicken uh, or camel or other species, then you would choose something like the 488 or the 800 die. And then with all four, you could choose 650, 550, uh, 488, uh, 800, Alexa 4 800, Alexa 4 790, or look for directly labeled primaries or uh, direct uh, secondaries to um, uh, tagged proteins. The last step in detection is imaging, and here I'll, I'll talk about imaging on the iBright imaging system, but what I, I talk about applies to a wide variety of imaging systems. And there's just some important features to look at and consider uh, uh, with your imaging platform. So most imaging platforms are using CCD-based cameras. Uh, some may use uh, laser scanners and photodiodes. Um, but some advantages and limitations of CCD cameras is they have a very nice dynamic range uh, compared to film. Uh, dynamic, they're all generally 16-bit uh, systems, which will give a dynamic range of about 4.8 orders of magnitude. <coughs> um, imaging systems such as iBright um, have algorithms in them that help determine the optimal exposure time to not overexpose or underexpose your sample. Uh, which is a big issue with trying to determine the right optimal exposure times with film. They allow direct uh, image analysis directly on the system or supporting software. They allow backup storage so you don't have uh, notebooks full of film. And they have direct quantitation built right into them. And you can instantly visualize and share your results. Uh, so imaging systems are very, very helpful for that. Um, of course, some limitations. Um, you know, you have instrument costs and instrument maintenance, maintenance compared to film. Um, and when you're doing fluorescent western blotting on CCD-based systems, uh, compared to chemiluminescence, where you can sit there and expose for a very long period of time, uh, with fluorescent western blotting, increased time does not necessarily mean increased uh, signal like it does with chemi. Because you can get increased bleed through from excitation light sources, uh, which will just increase background as you increase time. Um, but uh, imaging uh, systems are very, very helpful and uh, very useful, and uh, film is dramatically uh, reducing in, in usage. In fact, uh, uh, I'd say well over 60% uh, of customers are u now using imaging systems. You can get very similar levels of sensitivity as you can with film. Here you can see different targets looking at a variety of sensitivities, both on the iBright imager and on film. And here we're using 10-second exposures. But the biggest advantage of uh, imaging systems is the dynamic range and uh, determining optimal exposure time. Uh, imaging systems, you can simply select uh, smart exposure. Um, it will look for when the signal is saturating and not allow it to go beyond saturation. And you can get very linear good signal all the way down, uh, as you can see in the, the uh, Q80 uh, image. Where on film, uh, 
<clears throat> this you can see the exposure is um, overdone. The, the bands have bled together and they're, they're saturated. Even though I get high levels of sensitivity, most of that data is not useful. You can see this on the uh, graph over on the right, looking at dynamic range uh, on an imaging system compared to film. Film has got a very narrow dynamic range, often less than two, uh, or, uh, uh, two orders of, of magnitude where up top they saturate quite uh, quickly and you cannot tell that it's saturated. Uh, there's no data there to, to tell you it's saturated. Uh, very li small linear range and then at the bottom, once again, you lose uh, sensitivity or ability to distinguish uh, low uh, differences between the bands at the low end because uh, many of the pixels are still saturated even with a very low signal. Um, where on an imaging system you get very long dynamic range uh, and very linear dynamic range uh, signal as, as the signal increases. And also the system will tell you wh which bands are, and pixels are saturated up, up top so you'll be able to determine if the data is useful for quantitation or not. <clears throat> also, uh, the iBright imaging system uh, allows you to select a wide variety of excitation and emission channels uh, to make it directly compatible with a wide variety of, uh, of dyes. So you have excitation channels from 450 to 485, uh, 515 to 550, 610 to 635, 655 to 680, and then 750 to 6, uh, 765, and then uh, emission channels um, from 5, 510, 565, you know, 700, 7, 730, and 800. And this makes them directly compatible with a wide variety of dyes, Alexa 4 Plus, the Dialyte 488, 550, a wide variety of dyes, and a wide variety of specialty dyes where you can combine excitation channels of 488 with emission at 700 or 650 uh, for a variety of different dye choices. Um, having all these channels uh, Available allows you to do fourplex uh, imaging, as you can see here, uh, a very nice fourplex imaging for four different targets, four different channels, and no bleed through or contamination between uh, channels. Um, and while this has uh, <clears throat> six, five different excitation channels, we do recommend that you use, uh, avoid using uh, the, the 650 and 700 channel together uh, as a small amount of bleed through can, can occur between those channels. Um, another advantage of an imaging system is uh, a very large uh, field of view. Here I'm imaging four different blots at the same time. Uh, I can image them all at the same time and analyze them each independently as different data sets. And each channel is a, uh, can be made as a separate image. We're doing that on film uh, is impossible. And We'll conclude sort of at this last slide showing an experiment beginning to, uh, beginning to end and some of the advantages of fluorescent western blotting. So in this experiment, um, we're looking at the cleavage of PARP uh, um, using storosporin treatment. And you can go to low levels of storosporin to increase the levels of storosporin uh, uh, treatment. And you'll get an increased amount uh, of cleavage occurring over time. And then we're also normalizing uh, down here using a gap DH as a loading control. Uh, here's the two independent channels. So one, uh, I believe, taken in the uh, 800 channel and one in the 550 channel. Uh, and you can get, uh, once again, the data. And then the, the system will automatically uh, detect uh, and give you intensity values. And you can normalize against your loading control. And you can look at your non-stimulated. There's no cleaved part in non-stimulated. And then as you increase uh, treatment, you can see increasing amounts uh, of, of PARP expression levels uh, <clears throat> based on the treatment level. And you get very narrow er error bars, very clean signal, and can normalize it and do this uh, experiment in a matter uh, of seconds on the instrument. And with that, I'd like to finish and say, uh, <clears throat> Western blotting is a beginning to end process. You need to look at what you're doing all the way from the separation steps and optimize your buffers and gel chemistries and ladders to your transfer devices, your membranes used and how you transfer based on the molecular weight of your target. And then detect, um, look at optimizing your buffers, your reagents, your antibodies, 
and then your imaging systems. And with that, I'd like to stop and answer any questions, and thank you for your time. Any questions, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Haney, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. The first question is, what is more sensitive? Chemiluminescent or fluorescent Western blotting, and by how much? Hi, yeah, that's a very common question, and it's really going to depend on the substrate you're using. Um, some substrates, the basic ECL substrates, have fairly limited uh, sensitivity and will have sensitivity very similar to fluorescent, will be uh, approximately equivalent. Where uh, if you use a very high sensitivity uh, sensitive uh, uh, substrate like Femto uh, or Dura, uh, chemiluminescence can be uh, a little bit more sensitive, I mean, down to uh, the uh, femtogram uh, level. It's also dependent on the time you acquire the image. Uh, fluorescent images are typically very, very short. You're taking a fluorescent image in somewhere between less than a second to 20 or 30 seconds. And, and then you're really capped at that period of time. Uh, fluorescent images really don't have a benefit of taking an image for a longer period of time. Uh, you just get the same signal or you get background uh, due to excitation light. Where a chemi image, since it's producing its own light and there's no other background, you can leave the, uh, the, the, the system sit on uh, the chemi signal for a very long time or, or let it sit on film. And so uh, that way, uh, uh, chemi luminescent can be more sensitive, uh, probably by about one, uh, one, one uh, order of magnitude, maybe about tenfold uh, from low picogram level to uh, mid femtogram level, depending on the target and your primary antibody's uh, efficiency. Thank you for that answer. The next question is, I sometimes see uneven backgrounds in both chemiluminescent or fluorescent detection. What are some other factors that account for this? So in addition to the blocking and handling that I talked about, definitely a good blocker, a uh, strong enough blocker and handling, other things that impact uh, background uh, can quite often come down to very simple things um, and how you're handling and processing it. Uh, when you're shaking a, a, a Western blot in a tray or a processor and rocking back and forth, um, if you have uneven liquid covering uh, and it, it can cause uneven backgrounds, uh, shakers can uh, you know, cause less liquid to be in the center or more at the edges, which will give you uneven background uh, or swirling, um, and that can cause an impact. Also, cutting membranes with rusty scissors in chemiluminescent uh, western blots will cause a signal um, and uneven background. And of course, fingerprints and uh, other uh, touching of the, of the membrane. Uh, but be just be very careful that you're using enough liquids over your membranes and blots, and you're allowing enough time uh, of the wash steps, uh, um, you know, and, and changing your wash your wash buffers frequently after blocking and, and secondary antibody. Um, also, if you're doing a chemiluminescent Western blot, quite often people uh, leave too much substrate on the membrane so it's quite wet and there'll be puddling of the substrate around the blot and that can cause edge effects on the blot or very hot spots at the edges of the, uh, of the membrane. Um, those are sort of the main things that can cause it. Um, also make sure when you're transferring the gel, cut off the stacker and other things so you don't get um, uh, low density acrylamide embedded in your uh, uh, membrane when you transfer. That can also cause background issues. I would like to once again thank Dr. Paul Haney for his presentation. I would also like to thank Thermo Fisher Scientific for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everybody know that today's webcast will be available on demand viewing through September of 2019. Please share with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.